name is Romy Jo Swales. Thank you so much for clicking on this video and welcome to the first installment of a Get Ready With Me series called Highlights and History. So on this series, we're going to learn about an Afrocentric African history. Over this last year, I felt more and more like being knowledgeable about our own histories forms such an integral part of us feeling proud, being unified and in love with our unique identities. Growing up, I felt like I learned a lot of African history from the perspective of the Western world. And well, this is me striving to change that narrative. Every Wednesday while I do my makeup, we'll learn about a new influential person or community that greatly influenced African history. So if unlearning what we think we know about Africa and relearning its rich cultural history is something you're keen on learning about and watch me do some random makeup <laughs> then don't forget to like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment okay so before we start i've listed a couple disclaimers down below please have a read through it before you comment just so that we're all on the same page the main one of which being that this is a fun learning platform where we're all going to grow together and i'm absolutely open to discussion but i will not condone any kind of hate speech either directed towards me or anybody else because this is meant to be chilled okay sharp so without further ado let's get into it oh yeah by the way i've already prepped and primed my skin so i did my usual routine i've also done my eyebrows already because actually my eyebrows are blonde underneath here and i thought it would be a little hectic for the first episode to have like no eyebrow Romy, so <laughs> it's already like cars and also i filmed this like thousands of times before and it is exceptionally hard to do your brows and talk like at the same time so I decided I wanted to kick the series off with a female heroine. But in order to begin talking about her, we're going to have to give her some context. So, picture this, right? It's the 1500s and the Southern African region is bountiful, vibrant. And the region was populated by the San hunter-gatherers, the Khoi Khoi pastoralists and they were later joined by West African Bantu speaking people that had migrated downward. The rock and the copper art was thriving, agriculture was fruitful because of the nearby rivers and complex social structures were being developed as a result of the gold and ivory trade through the Indian Ocean. There were settlements, ports and growing communities. Certainly not a barren land that was just waiting for the Europeans to come and colonize. You see, by the 1400s, there was already regular international trade happening, first through the Chinese explorers and then with the arrival of Bartholomew Dias, the Portuguese, in 1488. You see, by the 1500s, the indigene Khoi Khoi people had already established successful trade through Table Bay with Dutch, French and British explorers and had even rose to international claim by defeating one of Portugal's greatest military forces in the Battle of Salt River. Essentially, what I'm trying to say is that by the time Jan van Riebeek arrived, 200 years later, literally nobody was phased by it. It was not our first rodeo, and we had seen these Europeans already. We knew what they wanted. And yet, for some reason, our history books always gave so much credit to him and the Dutch East India Company for founding Cape Town. So with all that information in mind, and now that we know what kind of Southern Africa we're dealing with, let's move on to our main attraction. Her name is Kritoa. Now, Kritoa was born in 1642 into a thriving Khoi Khoi seaport community known as the Kamisa people. Now, she was the niece of Chief Ochumato, who was a multilingual Khoi Khoi entrepreneur who had left quite a legacy behind him. Basically, she had the makings of greatness. Based on the description of her appearance, it can be speculated that she could have been of both mixed European and Khoi Khoi heritage. Now, if you remember correctly, Jan van Rubik arrived in the Cape in 1652, 10 years after the birth of Kritoa. And actually, at the age of 10, she joined Jan van Rubik's household. Now, some say she was kidnapped by Jan van Rubik as a result of a sour interaction with um, her uncle. And other sources say that she was actually a trade agreement between her uncle, who was the chief of her community, and Jan van Rubik. However she got there, she initially worked for Jan van Rubik's wife, Maria, um, because she was just like constantly giving birth and whatever and needed a lot of help. She also kind of acted as a liaison between Jan van Rubik and her community. So in exchange for her services, she'd take tobacco, bread, brandy, beads, iron, copper to her community. And in exchange, when she came back to Jan van Rubik's household, she was expected to bring with her cattle, um, tusks, hides, seeds, pearls, a host of things. 
But see, Jan van Rubik always knew that this girl was special. In just 65 journal entries, he mentions her name over 200 times and speaks about her very fondly, if you know what I mean. It's said that two years later, in 1654, Kratowa tries to run away with her uncle. However, she's caught and eventually returned to the Van Rubik household. God, talking and doing this is not easy. <laughs> I gotta take a little bit off. As she got older, her Dutch and Portuguese and her understanding of the European culture improved exponentially. According to reports, at the age of 14, Kratoa really started blossoming and like coming into herself. At the age of 15, Kratoa became Jan van Rubik's personal interpreter, diplomat, ambassador to not only between him and the indigenous populations that were surrounding his area, but also to other Europeans that arrived. He honestly could not stop singing her praise. What's going on? I know this color looks too light, but I swear it will work out. You must understand, this was a very complex cultural environment and experience to be found in at the age of 14. It was complicated because, right? On the one hand, she was effectively a slave in this European household where she wore traditional European clothing and even sometimes traditional Balinese clothing. If you know anything about the trade route, they go past Bali, so there were a lot of like Balinese slaves that had been brought into the house. In the 1650s, Kritoa was effectively the only individual possessing both an intimate knowledge of both Khoi Khoi culture and European culture at the same time. And she continued to pass information from one side to the other, back and forth all the time, and this caused people to struggle to trust her. She spoke their languages and interacted with many Europeans, mainly male, mainly thirsty male sailors, that came through the port and also effectively through Jan van Rubik's like fort and household. By her late teens, she had already had two kids out of wedlock. Historians credit this to the fact that often there was a lack of females moving through the port and so sailors that came past with the help of tobacco and alcohol would take advantage of the indigenous woman and Kratoa. And what's even sadder is you'll see that alcohol became quite a trend throughout her lifetime. Okay, quick change because I'm meant to be going somewhere and I'm currently late. So yes, I chose a good time to record. <laughs> um, also, I know I look like a ghost. Stop shouting at me. I'm going to sort it out right now. Just stay tuned. I'm sorting it out. I'm sorting it out. I'm sorting it out. I told you. I'm a weird color because it was winter and now it's suddenly summer. But I didn't tan. So, yeah. Now, being a woman, she was obviously shunned for having children and not being married. And some historical accounts say that people referred to her as a deceitful whore or a vixen with vile unchastity, never mind the men who raped her, apparently. If you were wondering, she did use to change into her traditional way and partake in her um, community's traditional rituals. And Van Rubik would allow this because he would use this opportunity for her to regain the trust of her people so that you could get her to feed him information about them, report back, and to basically manipulate them. Kratoa was not blind though, she wasn't stupid, and she knew exactly what Van Rubik wanted. He wanted control of the Cape, and he became the founder of segregatory laws such as um, Group Areas Act, where he implemented forced removals of the indigenous local Khoi Khoi community and people and rehomed them into areas where they were for sure never going to mix with the Europeans. And of course, this is the part where Kratoa started to double cross Jan van Rubik. My girl was instrumental in relaying information during the first Kuna Dutch War of 1659 to 1660, where the Kuna people actually won that war and once they had, she was involved in the negotiations that occurred between the Dutch and the Khoi afterwards. In fact, at one point, she saves her uncle from being killed by Jan van Rubik by suggesting that he rather exiles him to none other than Robben Island, which, if you don't know, is where, uh, <laughs> where Nelson Mandela and the rest of the ANC was imprisoned. Jan van Rubik was getting quite suspicious of her, obviously. So what he did was he educated and employed another interpreter and then pitted them against each other. This new interpreter named Doman, well, I don't hope I'm saying that right, who was also an indigenous person, didn't trust her and called her a traitor. In fact, he was quoted as saying, I'm a Hottentot, which is a derogatory Dutch word for the local indigenous Khoi Khoi people. He said, I'm a Hottentot and not a Dutchman, but you, Kritoa, carry favor with the commander who was Jan van Rubik. 
But damn, this must have been such a complicated experience for her. Like, think about it. She was a young indigenous woman growing up around rough foreign European men, aiding in political negotiations, helping with childbirths of the commander's wife, taking care of her own kids, trying to get through her own puberty, like periods without like sanitary towels and things. That must have sucked. And then at odds with where her loyalty lay. Anyway, eventually, Jan van Riebeek grew tired of her, which meant that the little place in Dutch society that she was kind of enjoying came to an end. And the last time she interpreted for Jan van Riebeek was in 1661, until a year later, she eventually left the Cape in 1662. Sadly, the same year that she left, both her uncle, the chief, her mother and her sister died which left her absolutely alone in the world. She had two kids and now she was on the outskirts of both Dutch society as well as her home, her community. In 1662, she became the first indigene woman to be baptized into the Christian church, which was actually quite a clever move on her part to remain part of Dutch society and then not to ostracize. After this, she became the first Southern African indigenous woman to be married to a Dutch official named Peter van Mira. Marriage between indigenous people and Europeans was not yet outlawed. However, this did actually create some kind of controversy. But again, super strategic because now that she was officially a Christian Dutch woman who was married, she couldn't be touched. I actually can't line my lips while I talk, so just hold on, give me a moment. So because she was no longer useful to the Dutch, but they couldn't actually do anything about her, they instead decided to exile her and her new family to Robben Island, again the same island that Nelson Mandela and other prisoners were exiled to during apartheid. By 1666 she had given birth to another three babies. Unfortunately during her time on Robben Island it was heavily speculated that she was further abused by her husband Peter. Her marriage only lasted about three years because in 1667, just one year after the birth of her final child with her husband, he died while out on expedition. Can you be even more unlucky? Now widowed and with five children, Krotoa, or Eva as she was now known, decided to move back to the mainland, which was Cape Town. Sadly, as a result of her trauma and her bitterness and unhappiness, she developed a really bad drinking habit, as one might. To make matters worse, her two illegitimate children, you know, the ones she had when she was a teenager, were taken away from her and placed in homes and historians have never been able to identify what happened to them. And then her three children that she had with her husband were taken from her and sent to Mauritius. She was finally banished back to Robben Island where she lived out the rest of her days until she passed away at the age of 31 in July 1674. In hindsight, it's believed that she suffered from post-traumatic stress as a result of all the disappointments and trauma that she faced during her lifetime. Upon hearing about her death and after all that she had done for the Dutch in order for them to create a life in the Cape, all that the Dutch could say was, and I quote, with the dogs she returned to her own vomit. And you know, the saddest thing about this is that we weren't actually ever taught her proper legacy in school. Well, at least I don't remember this. We never learnt about what a fiercely intelligent interpreter she was, without whom Jan van Riebeek could have never set up the Cape as he did. We never learnt that she was the daughter of a thriving, developed, trading community of indigenous people. Most importantly, we never learnt that she, along with her uncle, the chief, and the other interpreter, Doman, that she was pitted against by Jan van Riebeek, lay the foundations for one of our most well-known languages in South Africa, Afrikaans, and that her descendants can actually be traced to this day. She wasn't just some indigenous Khoi Khoi woman that was then enslaved by Jan van Riebeek. She is actually the mother of our heritage and we should continue to celebrate and acknowledge the great impact she had and the sacrifices she made in order to create the heritage of Southern Africa that we enjoy today. Well guys, that concludes our first episode of Get Ready With Me Highlights and History with me, Romy Jo Swales. If you enjoyed today's episode, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Leave me a comment down below. Don't forget to read the disclaimers in the description box and I will also link all my references down there in case you'd like to read further. I hope you learned something important and interesting about our Southern African heritage. I will be exploring the greater African region um, as well as maybe it's diaspora. I just thought it would be nice for the first episode to do something that was close to home as I am from South Africa. This is my final look. 
I'm quite impressed for the first time. It's really difficult doing liner like this. Like, it's, I'm stressed enough as it is. <laughs> um, if you do know what I was referencing in this look, comment down below. Okay, have a lovely day. Stay safe, be kind, and I'll see you next Wednesday. Bye. <laughs>